Oh, yeah, so thank you for coming to our presentation. Uh, this is Aero 202. I'm Daniel. This is Fred. And we're doing aircraft identification. So just to briefly recap, what exactly is plane spotting? It's a pretty interesting hobby that not a lot of people partake in. Um, I'm personally a huge fan, so this is why we did this project. I forced Fred to do it. Um, it's a hobby involving the tracking, photography, and ultimately identification of aircraft. So plane enthusiasts actually stand at the airport for hours, and we try and keep note of what airplanes we see. Now, the issue quickly appears in that this hobby is pretty hard to break into. Uh, airplanes look very similar. They move very quickly. I want you to take a note of these two aircraft over here. They're actually completely different models. But to you know, a normal person, there's no way. I can't even tell the difference, basically. Um, so to identify them, it's very hard. You either need a lot of prior knowledge, or you need a huge camera to get really close up pictures. So we thought, you know, we have smartphones now. Why don't we use a neural net and try and identify aircraft faster without the need for all that expensive hardware or knowledge? Um, to do that, obviously, we need a lot of data, and Fred's going to cover that now. Um, so basically, to collect our data, there's this website called airliners.net that has a bunch of uh, <clears throat> like uh, photos that people have manually reviewed. Um, so basically, they're vetted by a, lo <clears throat> by a lot of people. Um, so we know that the photos are very legitimate. Um, we used a web scraper um, called Beautiful Suit um, to basically go through the website and scrape all the images. Um, so eventually, we had 12 different airplanes from seven different airlines for a total of 3,600 photos. Um, and all these photos were normalized before we fed them into our neural network. And um, we also, uh, sorry, one second. Um, it's also been split across uh, train right, test right, and yeah. validation, as yeah. per usual. Yeah, so we had three different uh, splits. Um, so here you can see an example of, so we also manually went through the data set, and it was hand curated to remove bad photos. Um, so you can see an example here of like some photos that we would take as acceptable and some that were poor. So the acceptable ones that we would take were generally like side profile photos, where you could see a lot of the features that would distinguish planes from each other. And poor photos would be like photos at night, photos from the front or the back um, that made it very difficult to see different features. Um, so obviously this present, presents some limitations for our model. So if you took a photo from like the front, let's say, um, and you were using this tool, you probably our model probably wouldn't be able to detect it. And likewise, if you had a photo taken in the night, or perhaps one at like a very far distance where the um, actual airplane itself is very low low resolution, um, it might not be able to detect that. Um, so for our baseline model, we used a convolutional neural network, neural network very similar to assignment four. Um, so this consisted of two convolutional layers, um, each followed by two max pools, um, and two fully connected layers at the very end. Um, and the performance of this was uh, OK, considering it was just a baseline. Um, we achieved a validation accuracy of approximately 80%. Um, this is obviously signif significantly better than like, uh, a random percentage of approximately 8%, which we would get for 12 different classes. Yeah, so um, for our more advanced model, we decided to implement transfer learning just because we don't have a ton of data and we also have limited time and computing resources. Um, so we, just, we decided to select ResNet 152 for several reasons. ResNet's pretty well documented, and in particular, it's very deep. It uses something known as resi residual connections, which basically allow the uh, outputs from a certain layer to be uh, bypassed, uh, to be brought and bypassed past uh, a chunk of other layers and then fed back into layers that are deeper underneath it. So because of this, it's able to combat the vanishing gradient problem, which we did talk a little bit about in class. Um, because of this, it's 152 layers deep, which is massively bigger than anything we would be able to come up with ourselves. Um, so the parameters of the actual ResNet are frozen, a lot of convolutional layers. Um, and the only thing that we actually train on is just a final fully connected layer, which serves as the classifier. Um, down there, you can see some different parameters and things that we use. So we use cross-entropy loss, um, SGD, you can see the learning rate, momentum. And I'll talk a little bit more about the adaptive learning rate that we use later. It's an 800 plus megabyte model with over 50 million parameters. So our initial efforts with ResNet were OK, but we didn't get such good results. Um, it was maybe around 70 to 60% validation accuracy, which was lower than we expected. And we decided to try and correct that. You can see that the training itself is also not very stable. So we made some improvements. We uh, added an adaptive learning rate that actually decreases the learning rate when we hit plateaus. Um, we decided to use a bit of a higher resolution input for the images, because you can see the previous ones were just, they were way too, um, way too blurry to actually tell what was going on. Um, and we did a better data augmentation, things like clipping, cropping, um, adding noise. Um, we also rotated the aircraft less, because if you have an airplane that's upside down, 
that's not a very realistic example of a real picture. And you can see we were able to get basically 100% accuracy across all three sides. Um, we also um, were thinking of implementing um, YOLO object detection to intel intel intelligently crop our photos. Um, although, as you can see in the previous slide, our accuracies were already pretty good. So we had a script that could crop the photos before they were fed into the neural network, but we didn't actually implement this into our, uh, into our model. Um, here are just some graphs showing our performance. So you can see it's a lot more stable, and we're able to hit basically 100% quite rapidly. Um, so you're going to have to take my word for this, but these are some predictions that we made, just some random samples from our, I think, 600 image test set. And it got all of these correct. Um, you can see the variety of different images and angles, and the planes are in different states. They're on the ground, they're in the air, they're in different lighting. Um, this is our confusion matrix. You can see a very strong diagonal. The only things that I got <laughs> confused on were actually the two planes that I showed in the beginning, those two Air Canada planes, which humans would have a very hard time telling anyways. Uh, some more interesting examples of crazy angles and uh, different, there's even watermarks on the second picture. Um, and yeah, generally what we learned is that transfer learning is a great tool and it's something that we should try and expand on in the future. Uh, we might train on different classes if we had more time, but we were a little bit time constrained on this project, so we only did daytime side angles. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's really amazing. Just to be clarify, you said you have 100% on the test set as well? Yeah, 99.9. This is a test set confusion matrix. Okay, so back to, you had a slide where you had all three numbers somewhere, right? Oh, test. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, that says log. Oh, accuracy, I see. Uh, yeah. Like 99.83, I think. Yeah, I got, a, I got 100 on training, but oh, 99.83 on test. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, and so what were the sizes of the three sets? Um, so it's 3,600 images split across the three. Um, I think the test set was around 600 images. Um, validation was maybe like 800 or 900, and the rest was in uh, training. Okay. Um, and uh, the story, I want to just cast the story you said. Set, you use ResNet, you get 70% accuracy, and then you did a lot of data augmentation and hand, hand curation at that point. What was, what yeah, took you from yeah. 70 to 100? Exactly. Yeah, so um, we were a little bit naive, and we thought that, you know, we, we didn't use Google Colab that much initially, so we didn't know how much performance it was able to give us. So we scaled down the images a lot. One, to make it easier for us to actually move the images around on USBs or whatever, but also to make the training a little bit faster. So initially, our augmentation itself was way too aggressive. We were spinning the images like crazy. I think there was like a 45 degree rotation or something. And we were cropping into, you can see, like, tiny pieces of the airplane so that you basically cannot tell where this image came from. Um, after we realized that you know, ResNet was training actually pretty quickly, um, we said, OK, let's crank up the resolution. Let's um, augment a little bit less aggressively. And also, we implemented an adaptive learning rate. And that's what kind of brought us to a very high degree okay. of accuracy. That's not quite what you said earlier. So, uh, in your final report, make this clear. I think it's very important learning in that that trajectory is so make sure that shows up clearly. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, <coughs> With such impressive accuracy, uh, why didn't you think to add more classes to see at what point does it start to not get 100%? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think, unfortunately, we ran out of time here. But our main takeaway, actually, was that data processing took a very, very long time, which is something that other people have echoed as well. Implementing the actual model maybe took I'd say around like one night of actual work, and it was training already. But to collect data, that was maybe a week yeah. long of both of us just going through hundreds of thousands of images like it's manually. Maybe like 30 minutes to an hour for each like class, just to like go through the whole data set. Because um, even from initially, a lot of because airliners.net is a great source of aircraft images, but it doesn't really specify what the categories are. So you have pictures of planes from the inside, uh, cockpits, <laughs> cabins. Those are great, but they're not useful to us, right? So. Yeah. 